Yes, sir. Okay, thanks. So I had a question in the assignment. Uh, I was, did anybody find an answer for this? Or you had a difficulty in that? Anyway, I think I will just take it up now um, so that uh, I'll see if I can answer it. I haven't had a look at it, but I thought about a quick answer. Let's see if we figure out a mistake. So the question is that you have a gene of interest and uh, there is a BAM H1 site. And the vector is having um, BAM H1 site and equal R1 site. And then you have uh, the T7 promoters. The objective is to, uh, you should be able to clone it properly. After cloning it, you, you should be able to make a recombinant DNA for which on one side it is uh, directional cloning, okay, BAM H1 and ECO R1. And after that, you should be able to generate a antisense, antisense strand um, so that you can use it as a probe and it should be randomly labeled. OK, that's the objective of it. And the problem here is that the gene has, within its open reading frame, it has a BAM H1 site. So it gets a little bit difficult to make it a clone uh, on, on this way. I mean, in directional ones. So. The, po the point is, how can one generate a fragment, a DNA fragment? On one side, it should have a BAM H1 overhang, and on the other side, it should have eco R1 overhangs. So the simplest way I can think of, there are at least, there can be multiple ways of how you do it also. So uh, it's not a big deal, actually. So I have this gene of interest, right? So I'll put this arrowhead so that you know this is the start codon somewhere, and here is the stop of the open reading frame. And here is the BAM H1 site. So I should make uh, primers, and the primers should be, um, so the primers should be somewhere, say, I'm just making up like this. Only thing different is, if I, I can have eco R1 overhang uh, primer within the, uh, sorry, it, it, eco R1 linker within the region of this, uh, of the fragment. And on this side, I have a problem. If I put BAM H1 linker attached to this, I cannot use BAM H1 to cut this because uh, there is BAM H1 um, within the co reading region. So there are two ways how you'll do it. Uh, you would not have, uh, you, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have the linker there. But on the other one, you should have the uh, linker of eco R1 here, as shown here. So what you will typically generate in that case is, uh, you may generate a, the gene of interest with the open reading frame. You're doing PCR, okay? You do PCR with a primer that does not, it is just for amplifying primer on one side. And on the other side, you have a primer that has eco R1 linker. And now you you will get uh, something like this, right? This will be the eco R1 site. BAM H1 site is already there. On the other side, it is free. This is the product you will get. This product can be, uh, done in two different ways one is if you if you only have linkers for bam h1 say then you could have treated this with m bam h1 and then um, so the eco the site will already be methylated because of which bam h1 cannot be uh, cannot leave this part then you already have the eco R1 from the PCR. And now you can add a linker of BAM H1 here. So later you can cut it up 
with a BAMH one like this, and you can cut it up with eco R1 this way, and then clone it into a vector as shown in this side. Alternately, if you don't have the MBMH one, the simplest one is to add an adapter. Uh, here you have eco R1 site, and you can add BAMH one adapters. On both the sides, it might add up. But once you treat it with eco R1, it will cut like this. What you, you will end up having is eco R1 um, adapter on uh, this overhangs on one side and BAM H1 overhangs on the other side. Then you can clone it into the uh, vector. Did you understand this or is there any problem? This is not a big deal actually. It's about how flexible you are thinking and trying to incorporate all the things that we have learned in the earlier stages. If you knew that, uh, then the rest of it is much uh, very easy. OK. And now I think uh, your job, one's job would be to generate uh, the, you have to generate the probe that is randomly labeled. I think in one of the uh, classes, we have discussed about this. This is the promoter, say, start of it, ATG, then we have several codons, and then say we have TGA. The top strand is the coding strand. It is the plus strand. And uh, it is the non-template strand. That means the mRNA that we produce upon transcription should actually have AUG and UGA codons, right? That will be the plus, and that is the coding. And that is also, I mean, yeah, that is also the sense strand. Now, we are going to, you, the question says it is for northern blotting. If you are going to do for northern blotting, you should have um, had an antisense or the minus strand so that it will base pair with the um, mRNA. So usually this is indicated this top codon is at the arrowhead. The reading of uh, open reading frame is usually indicated like this. Right? And after cloning, on one side you have eco R1 and on the other side you have BAM H1. I hope you remember when I was describing about uh, vector P, gem or so, either B or E, so that only the antisense, is, antisense strand is produced. Right? Because antisense strand is the one that will base pair or is, it compl is complementary to the mRNA of the gene that we are looking for. Uh, I hope I have given you enough information to work it out. Um, the rest of the things are very easy. All I, I, you, you have to think about this stuff. Uh, that is where you practice. You, you should try to incorporate multiple things and get to the object. This is just one, op one way of doing it. Probably you can do it many other ways. But that is when your uh, thinking is stressed. And that is when you are expanding and becoming, uh, including more principles into your thought processes. OK? Uh, any questions? Did you find any fault with whatever I said so far? Uh, is there any mistake, technical mistake, in the answer I provided? If not, uh, the deadline is the same. You, you should have been, because I actually asked you all to I encourage you all to uh, discuss uh, among yourselves so that you will get, you'll find the, the answer. Each brain is unique. And if you all have um, engaged in discussions on this question, I, I'm sure uh, you would have ended up with the answer. OK? Not discussing is not a, 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 will not help. So please keep that in mind. Uh, so we will proceed with the. We will proceed with the uh, lesson now. So in the last class, we were discussing about several techniques that are involved in uh, uh, analyzing genetic variation. 
And today we will learn some techniques about analyzing gene expression. In the gene expression, there are usually several things. One of it is uh, analysis of um, transcription. And we will also have analysis of uh, translation at the level of protein. OK, so mostly I think today we will talk about how to quantify um, the amount of mRNA. So we are actually doing analysis of transcription. Um, some of the techniques are already easy and straightforward, uh, so because we have already discussed them. Northern blotting, it is about uh, RNA. You shouldn't say that it is about mRNA. That means you're excluding all the non coding RNA. So it is about evaluating the amount of RNA, which could be any of the RNAs, rRNA, tRNA, or mRNA. So typically, when you uh, perform um, RNA isolation of any, when you, when, you when you isolate the total RNA and you run the gel, especially this is true for uh, bacterial ones, what happens is you will find three distinct bands. People, when in during project, we ask uh, a question, what are those three bands that you see upon isolation within their own project? They would tend to say one represents mRNA and the other one rRNA and so on. That is absolutely wrong, right? Uh, all the distinct bands that are seen are usually that of rRNA, the ribosomal RNA. They are the most abundant RNA. You have multiple copies of each of these because of which you will see uh, these three uh, bands. One of it is very small, so sometimes it might have run out of the gel or it might be a little bit faint. So you might not see. So the large subunits, uh, the large rRNAs, 23S or 16S, is, are the ones that you usually see. mRNAs cannot be visualized directly on agarose electrophoresis especially because mRNAs have different sizes. Some of them are long, some of them are large, and each of them them have different copy numbers. So you cannot, it does not a straight or distinct should Okay, I'll wait one second. Uh, can you hear me? Can somebody confirm, please? I think I lost my connection. Can someone confirm? Katie Rabalan, can you hear me? OK, OK. Yes, that's fine. Uh, yeah, now the uh, connection is restored. So I was talking about, uh, about the random labeling. Why do we need random labeling? End labeling would have been uh, only on one side. A random labeling is you have multiple uh, radio labels included along the probe, right? Because you, have, you may have very less amount of mRNA. Of a, of a particular species, say X, Y, Z. You may have less mRNA. And then you are doing electrophoresis and filtering. You might have lost 
some mRNA in this if the transfer is incomplete. And if you're, pro you're adding a probe out of them, only a few mRNAs may have hybridized, right? So the actual uh, mRNA that would be detected could be very, very less. So in that case, we need an amplification of the signal. For that, because we want amplification of the signal, we use random labels. Okay. Okay. And I hope you know how it is done. The substrates, it is in vitro transcription. You can do uh, using substrates such as uh, in the in, in vitro transcription, you would have used alpha P32 labeled CTP or other ones. Okay. So that it gets incorporated into the probe. We have discussed this before. And then you'll hybridize and you'll find something like this. If you find this is A is assumed normal, in what you can say about B, it is less intense. Assuming that you have added equal amount of RNA in all of these when you have loaded in this sample, if you have added equal amount of uh, RNA, then one can say that XYZ mRNA is expressed less in B compared to A. Okay, it is always a relative uh, proportion that you are saying. We cannot say a thousand uh, mRNAs are produced or like that. We can only say how many fold it is more or less than compared to A to the control. Here, assume A is the control. And in C, there is no expression of uh, not mRNA of XYZ comparison in comparison to the control A. D has two copies, right? That is one thing uh, you can say. So sometimes what may happen is in some of the organisms here, I said two copies. There are two possibilities again. You may have two different promoters. Say, if a gene can be expressed from two different promoters that are in tandem, say, or like this, there is gene a W, and assume this is gene uh, X. From this promote, there is no terminator here. In this, after uh, W, there is no terminator. So if this promoter is active, then it will produce mRNA of this length. If this promoter is active, it will, it will produce both the ORF, W as well as X. In other one, there is only X. But when you do northern blotting, the shorter one will run faster and the longer one will run slower. So we need to be careful whether it is two copies of um, uh, X or not. Okay, so these things uh, you have to keep in mind. So in sometimes it might be two different copies. You might assume that in one case there was a uh, copy somewhere or shared uh, regions, but this is also possible where you might have X under two different uh, promoters that were upstream of X because of which two different mRNA species are produced. What you can conclusively say here is there are two mRNA sequences, mRNA species that have the same, uh, that have uh, the gene uh, nucleotide sequence representing gene XYZ. That's what you can say. Okay. It all, uh, many other things will depend on the context of it. So if I compare the northern blotting results with the southern blotting, I might have more details about it. So think of lot, uh, all the possibilities and then you will arrive at a good answer or accurate answer. The other one is called as RNA's protection assay. It is in, uh, it is kind of uh, techniques very much the, with the same objectives as sort of Northern blot to find out um, if you are having um, if, if the if you qu to quantify the mRNA of a particular gene. Here is uh, one nice uh, way of putting it. Um, so this is for a plasmid in with on one side you have T7 promoter and the other one you other side you have SP6 promoter. 
so if we allow sp6 to produce it might produce one type of mrna uh, something like antisense strand if we allow t7 to produce it will produce the sense strand like i was describing a little while ago about p gem where on both sides you have in that case the setting is something like this you have this and this is the uh, one t7 promoter and this is another t7 promoter and here we had dam h1 here we had eco r1 both are t7 so from this t7 the top one you will get the sense strand right that is how the normal transcription would have worked if this the other one the reverse uh, one sorry t7 promo, uh, promoter was active you will get the antisense the antisense is the one that you require for using it as a probe but the problem is if you use t7 polymerase then both the promoters will be uh, transcribed that means you will actually get a double stranded dna uh, rna molecule like this one sense strand from one promoter and the antisense from the other one if you get like this it is not useful for uh, using as probe because it has both the concept uh, both the strands it will interfere in the hybridization with the mrna species that we are trying to look at so what we need is only the antisense one because the sense is the mrna in that case you should have cut uh, with damage one and because we are going to use with the damage one there is going to be a mis there is a, going to be a problem when you are trying to answer your question try to think of it i i'm not going to uh, reveal everything yeah so if i uh, so what will happen is even though when i cut it this t7 polymerase can only produce this much small fragment it does not produce anything of the xyz that was that they have cloned whereas the on the other side t7 promoter is active and it will produce a uh, full length uh, antisense mrna antisense rna like this which can then be used as probe so uh, getting back to the technique of rna's protection assay try to remember the name and uh, it is straightforward from the uh, that is what the principle is also so you have the mrna and uh, you add antisense rna like we have generated in this case right you can also use uh, this one without yeah and then we will use rnas uh, we will add rnas to it this rna is specific to there are uh, several types of rnas here we are taking rnas that is specific to single strand rna so it will degrade all these parts okay and the all the other mrnas that are not bound to any of the uh, not, they are not bound to you'll have several other mrnas you may have rrnas and so on they all will also be digested into uh, uh, and the rna is degraded the only species mostly that is uh, that survives the rnas attack is the one that formed the double stranded the uh, double stranded rna molecule like this because we are using rnas that is specific to single strand rna so when you run the gel you will find that uh, we will find the band okay of course when you take here you should have you are making a probe randomly labeled one so you will find a band here okay here is a question that is for you to find out i don't have to discuss that what are the advantages of rna's protection assay uh, compared to northern blotting try to find the answers for it so let's just relate uh, this the, the technique name is rna's protection so the probe that we added is conferring protection from digestion by the specific rna all those that are not double stranded get degraded okay so you might have uh, a sample here and you may have added b sample here and c something like this one may have 
more uh, or intense band in another one you may have less or none so uh, so you can say that b has more expression of xyz compared to a and c does not have any expression of uh, xyz gene in comparison to a So the other one is, uh, this one is familiar with you all, reverse transcription PCR. So this is about trying to make cDNA. We have already discussed this in uh, when we made the cDNA libraries, right? So you use uh, primer uh, one, then you are doing reverse transcription primer. Here, we are not using oligo-DT. In cDNA libraries, we use oligo-DT because there we are constructing a library. That means we are trying to get all the, G all the mRNA. Uh, we are trying to clone all the mRNA species right? after converting into cDNA. Here, we are interested about one particular mRNA, and we are trying to see if it is expressed or not. So we use a uh, gene-specific primer, and then we produce the uh, use reverse transcription, reverse transcriptase. So it will produce the first cDNA strand. And now, because we are already we already know the sequence of the gene, uh, so you can always synthesize the second primer and then uh, uh, allow the production of the second strand. And then we can repeat these uh, PCRs uh, with primers one and two, so that you you will have a larger quantity of PCR uh, product. Remember that uh, reverse transcription PCR is not so quantitative, right? It is not quantitative because um, if you look at uh, how the PCR cycles, 2 will become 4, 4 will become 8, 16, and so on. And at one point, they may you may have an exhaustion of either DNTPs or any of those. Some exhaustion may have happened because of our primers also, because of which these are number of cycles, one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe 10 cycles or, or say 20 cycles. Assume we are running for 30 cycles. The PCR product is no longer increasing beyond that because whatever constituents that we have added, like DNTP primers or even DNA polymerase might get exhausted uh, because of which uh, are denatured because of which there is no longer incremental product it will reach a stationary phase and then after we finish the pcr we are going to run the gel right so we don't know we cannot use it for quantifying purposes just keep that in mind when we discuss uh, a little further you will understand better so this is uh, uh, a reverse transcription PCR because we are employing uh, this template is RNA, mRNA. Uh, you need to remember the reverse transcriptase enzyme, and you need to remember something about the primer. Primers are gene specific here because we are looking at the expression of one gene or not. Say you have A, B, C, and A is shown like this. And B also is likely to show like this, and C doesn't show a product, which would mean that um, C is not producing it. You can only infer uh, qualitative. That means whether gene XYZ is expressed in C or not, you can say. You cannot say how much of it is, is expressed. So um, RT-PCR, there are confusingly sometimes, uh, you, you can call it as reverse transcription PCR. And some people use it as uh, real-time PCR. Real-time PCR and reverse transcription PCR are entirely, not entirely, principle-wise, they, they both are dependent in a way on transcription PCR, uh, reverse transcription. But real-time PCR is quantitative as well. It has, It is quantitative, as we will see in a while. If you're talking about just reverse transcription PCR, it is not quantitative. You cannot infer quantity on basis of on the quantities of mRNA present in the sample. You can only say qualitative, yes or no. You cannot say how much, yeah? 
So now we are going to discuss about uh, real-time PCR. Um, I think today this is the focus of uh, today's class. So there are several uh, things we need to discuss before uh, we go ahead. Uh, there are two different um, popularly used ones, uh, used detection systems. Real-time PCR, the name comes from, uh, the point is, in in real time, the PCR, say, for example, you're running 30 cycles, and it is going to take about, uh, say, one and a half hour, approximate, say. And after each round of PCR, if you are able to quantify how much product is there, that means you are measuring the amount of signal, which is, an, which is representative of the product formed. That means you're doing, you're quantifying in real time. Real time is happening now, right? When the process is happening, you're able to do something else, uh, quantifying or evaluating it. So here in this real time PCR, it is about quantifying the product in real time. If you see what we have done in, in uh, reverse transcription PCR, after we have finished the PCR, we will run on the gel. We are quantifying after the PCR is over, right? Whereas in real-time PCR, we are quantifying after each PCR cycle. Each PCR cycle, how much is there? After second round, how much is there? After third round, how much is there? Like that, we are we there is a, a machine, real time PCR machine, which can measure this. So we also need a way of detecting it also. So there are two popular ones. Uh, one is based on Cyber Green assay, and the other one is Tacman assay. So the Cyber Green assay is Cyber Green is a molecule that can bind to uh, double stranded dna okay it cannot bind to single stranded dna and there is one more thing is uh, if it is bound to double stranded dna it can fluoresce there is fluorescence so if you are running pcr and two two uh, products have formed then there is a certain amount of uh, fluorescence after two the two templates will become four templates then you have little more of uh, little more of this product form and then after that eight you'll have more uh, more amount of fluorescence based on fluorescence you can uh, the cycle this is on cycles and here is the intensity of fluorescence so you can track how much of double stranded dna is forming in the pcr reaction and which is uh, uh, done by the measurement or estimation of the fluorescence okay uh, yes, so this is how uh, cyber green works. It is specific, it can bind to double stranded DNA. Upon binding, it can fluoresce. Otherwise, unbound cyber green does not fluoresce. Whereas the next one is called a Stackman uh, assay, it, uh, which has a primer and a probe annealing. So you are using at least two different primers and the other probe this this is the key why you call tacman uh, uh, assay is you use a tacman pro probe tacman probe is something like this it has a fluorophore here and you have a quencher here so if these two are nearby this is the fluorophore it doesn't fluoresce but this is the quencher it will quench or try to repress the fluorescence, you can think of it that way. But if these two are far apart, the fluorophore and the quencher are separate and far apart, then this one is going to fluoresce. So what they use is they make a small primer. On one side, they attach it with a quencher. On the other side, they attach it with a uh, fluorophore. So they, there is no fluorescence because the fluorophore, uh, fluorescence is quenched by this uh, the quencher here. Okay, but if 
by some nucleus activity if this is cut down the, the fluorophore will go separate and then it will start fluorescing okay i hope you understood the concept so when you use a primer here like this in the forward primer and this is going to synthesize the dna like this and at one point it is going to encounter this region right which is already bound by a tacman probe so you're choosing a primer uh, you're choosing two primers one is in this way like this which can hybridize this here and you're choosing another primer which is uh, going to bind just a little bit upstream of it so you have this quencher and this is the fluorophore and the dna polymerase is going to synthesize and when it comes here, it is going to hydrolyze this uh, primer like this by something similar to that of what DNA polymerase would do. Here it has five prime two, three prime exonuclease activity. Okay, so the DNA polymerase will will uh, chop off this uh, primer like this because of which the fluorophore is now separate or distant from the quencher and therefore it will start glowing okay so uh, that those are the two techniques that are available i hope you you can uh, you can relate it to you, you i hope you understood it um, so i can also quickly say that uh, tacman is much more accurate and it is specific because um, it is much more sensitive, actually. They, they, because even if primer dimers or something are forming, uh, the Tacman, this is not going to give as much as uh, signal compared to what Cyber Green would do. But Tacman probes are very expensive to buy because somebody has to add uh, the fluorophore and the quencher. They will all chemical reactions are there and. It is a little bit expensive to produce those kinds of probes. But fluorescence is much uh, easy, and uh, it's easy to store this stuff, uh, store and perform reactions as well, unlike in Tacman polymerase. These ones should be stored carefully, uh, which otherwise they might have uh, fallen off or some things like that may happen. This is the same uh, thing representing again, if you have lost, uh, if you didn't understand, you can think there are three primers. One is this. Uh, this is the PCR, right? So you also have a reverse primer. Only thing is you have a probe that is Tacman probe with the reporter. That is the one that is going to fluoresce and a quencher. DNA polymerase, when it is synthesizing, when it comes to this, it will degrade the uh, the probe like this because of which the fluorescence the reporter will start fluorescing and because we are measuring after each round of pcr cycle we can measure how much of fluorescence is emitted from that pcr after each round of pcr uh, cycle so what you would typically see is a graph like this okay if you understood this graph uh, that will be fantastic so this is the amount of signal on y-axis. On x-axis, you have PCR cycles. So for each of the uh, machines, you have a detection limit, isn't it? So, um, so assume that um, I will take A, B, and C. In A, you have like um, say 10 or 10 mRNA molecules that I'm, I'm interested in. In, Sam, in B, there are five, and in C, there are two, OK? What we will do is uh, we'll try to get write some numbers so that we'll see if we can understand it clearly. What would happen after one cycle? After cycle one, this would become 20, this is 10, and this one is four. I will give again uh, one more thing I have to, I said detection limit. I will just, I'm, whatever I'm giving here, it's just for understanding sake. Assume that the detection limit is 100, meaning that only after the products increase more than 100, it will start detecting and increasing like this. Until 100, it does not give, uh, it's, 
the amount of product is not proportionate to the fluorescence or so just that is how detection limit can be described so after cycle two what would happen this is going to be 40 this is going to be 20 and the other one is going to be eight then cycle three it is 80 this will be 40 and this is going to be 16 and cycle four so if i'm also going to draw a graph okay just for understanding sake uh, i'll try to draw it a little bigger so uh, i'll draw here assume that this is the graph here is the intensity and here is the number of cycles so and then uh, at cycle four you have 160 and the other one is 80 the other one is 32. so this is cycle one two three four at four you are starting to see a, a an increase like this okay before you go ahead i would want to say that you're not testing all of them in one pcr reaction you have PCR reaction, three tubes. The machine can measure about, uh, I think, 96 wells at a time, right? So in one of it, you use, in all of it, everything is same except your template, that is the mRNA. In one, you added from A. Uh, in the second one, you added from B. And the third one, you want you added from C. So the, the A will start to give a signal at fourth round. And that uh, the others do not give a signal. And when you have, when you go to sixth, fifth round, uh, sorry, yeah, you'll have 320 of these, 160 of these, and uh, 64. So for the next fifth round, A is somewhere here. You have more amount of concentration. And B would be now coming to this. And C is still in the same line. Now you go for to sixth uh, cycle. I am losing on the numbers. You can help me probably. 640, uh, 320, and uh, 812, right? So uh, in sixth cycle, A is having this much concentration. B is having something like this. C is now coming to this place. Seventh cycle. Eight, one, two, yes. Is that right? Um, sorry, no, 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 no. 256, sorry. So now you have A is here, and B is here, and C is here. Something like that. What I mean to say is the more number of initial molecules you have, the earlier it is detected and it will go through this exponential phase and then at the it will reach a, a plateau at one point whereas uh, the same thing the b if you have medium number then it will come later and the lowest one will be, will show the the this band or sorry this uh, curve at the later stage so what people do, I'm erasing this so that you will, will have, uh, we just understand from here. What they then do is they, they try to make a, uh, I think it is called as uh, CT values. Right? This is a relative uh, measure of how many fold the, uh, the mRNA is present in test samples compared to the control assume a is control assume b is controlled okay b is the control that we are adding that is the normal cells what you can say from here is a has higher uh, uh, a has higher number of mrna molecules than the control b and c has less number of mrna the specific xyz mrna compared to that of the B, that is with the control. So uh, this is called real-time PCR. The objective is to find 
the amount of specific sequence that is here mRNA uh, amount of specific mRNA I will mRNA of gene in this sample if you if I didn't have uh, control then it would be difficult to make a an interpretation you cannot say if it is more or less you should have done with the control only anything without a control is not an experiment it could be just an observation from which you cannot really say too much uh, so the objective of real time pcr is to determine the amount of mrna of a gene in the sample if you have more amount uh, the principle is to measure the mrna after uh, measure the reporter uh, reporter fluorescence after each round of uh, pcr cycle and the more earlier it reaches it gives a detectable product would mean that it has uh, higher um, it has higher amount and if it gives late then it means it is a it is lesser in amount uh, okay um, there are test classes as i already told there is going to be a problem with this but for until cloning and uh, you should be able to tell what is the mistake also and then i, I gave you enough of uh, information in today's class to answer this one so you should be able to do that if you can you should be able to find faults with uh, what is given um, in the protocols like in in the last class uh, CIA we had a question where directly it says find the fault with the question uh, find the fault with the protocol here too there is an issue you should have been able to find it out and be and be able to describe it in your video then um, we were learning about uh, northern blotting i just revised why uh, the, the the probe preparation and uh, how would it look like in the, when it is in electrophoresis and what are the information that you can infer from a northern blot you can say whether it is present or not you can also say relatively if it is higher expression or lower expression you can also say sometimes if there are two copies or if there are two promoters from uh, for one gene okay you say when you have two bands it it does mean that there are two, two mrna species that are that have the same sequence or at least they share similarity in the sequence that is it is based on the probe of course okay that could be non specific binding also but if it were non specific binding you would also expect in control and also in b and c right you don't see the second band here so there is something specific about it in uh, sample d that could be that of course means that there are two uh, two mrna species with the shared uh, homology or sequences which could be because of two promoters or it could be because of two copies of the gene just keep that in mind and then we have learned about rna's protection assay it is based on uh, protecting the mrna species that we are looking at for that we have to synthesize a probe uh, randomly labeled probe which is antisense to the uh, to the mrna that we are looking uh, we are analyzing for so the rna is used is specific to single stranded rna so it will degrade all the rna that is single stranded what would be uh, what would not get degraded is the one that is uh, because of probe and uh, the rna hybridization so that when you run on gel 
is visible uh, and then uh, upon audio radiography you will find out that it is a question about how um, how rns protection assay is beneficial or the advantages of rns protection assay over northern blotting then we have uh, we spoke about reverse transcription pcr and real time pcr they both have the principles are almost similar i mean the materials are almost similar we are the uh, objectives are also similar in a way that we are trying to uh, see the detect the mrna of our interest both are uh, both involve reverse transcription if you are going to do for mrna alone um both can be uh, it can whereas in reverse transcription we only perform the analysis after finishing all the pcr the whole pcr cycle whereas in real time pcr we can analyze while it is still being run you need a, a special pcr machine a device a rt pcr machine which has um, say for example you have these are the micro titer plates in, in which you have uh, all these pcr tube you don't use any more pcr tubes you have these uh, mitral titer plates so after each round a scanner will uh, put in light and uh, it will check for fluorescence in each of these wells okay and then it will record on this well uh, the fluorescence after round 2 is like this and round 3 is like this and so on eventually it will try to build uh, build uh, the these something like this that we will see in the next one so yes in the rt pcr uh, we are using primers that are specific to the rna of our interest and then we perform ag agros electrophoresis and you can say um, the amount the whether rna is pro that particular mrna is produced or not whether transcription of that gene is happening or not and in the real time pcr there are two types of detection systems one is cyber green which is more popular easy to handle and uh, much every, every majority of the labs use that nowadays uh, tacman probes are much more specific because um, uh, they do not bind to every double strand dna right whereas cyber green is about specific to double strand dna if it binds then it will make fluorescence the restackman probe is a special uh, one which has uh, the prime the primer is small oligo on one side attached to a quencher on the other side it is attached to a fluorescent probe because the quencher and the fluorescent uh, probe are nearby there is no fluorescence so you design a, a primers like this one is a forward primer the other one is a reverse primer these primers are specific to the gene of interest or mrna of your interest and the probe uh, the the tacman probe should also be designed within the i mean it should be it should be obstructing the uh, dna rna polymerase that is synthesizing this right uh, or dna polymerase as the case may be so when dna polymerase the dna polymerase that you should that you use should have 5 prime nucleus activity so we know that uh, the dna polymerase have 3 prime to 5 prime exonucleus sorry uh, polymerization activity uh, they have uh, they have 3 prime to 5 prime exonucleus activity that is proofreading activity and there is one more that is 5 prime to 3 prime exonucleus activity that is present in dna polymerase one and if you remove this the rest would be the clino fragment so i think it's this is called as exclino exoclino or, or something uh, like that so you should have a polymerase which has the 5 prime nucleus activity so if you remember something like nick translation okay this has nothing to do with translation that we already read as a process but instead the dna polymerase will keep synthesizing when it encounters this it will degrade using the 5 prime to 3 prime exonucleus activity it will degrade this rna this probe uh, tacman probe because it is degraded the reporter is now far away from the quencher because of which it will give 
uh, fluorescence as shown here. That way, each round of cycle will allow the release of more and more of the reporter. That is detected and uh, plotted as a graph by the machine. So the, uh, the earlier it is detected, then that means that you had more number of copies. Copies are high in number. The less, uh, the late it comes, that means the relatively the copies are less in number. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, I'm hoping to see your reference, uh, your uh, um, assignments. Do you need an extension? Okay, nobody is speaking, so I don't think you need an extension. No, nobody is speaking. You can turn on your mic and say. Yes, sir. What? We need extension for assignment. 